Okay, welcome back. Uh, this video we will cover chapter 13, the respiratory system. Right, first, we'll talk about the actual process of respiration and steps that are involved. Uh, first, a formal definition for respiration. It's the whole process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere that you're breathing and all the way down to the body cells. And it includes uh, multiple steps. Uh, the first one, ventilation. This is the generic moving of air in and out of the lungs. There's no exchange, it's just moving air in or out of the lungs. Uh, next we have external respiration. This is the exchange of gases between the air and the lungs and also the blood. All right, after that you get the transport of gases uh, by blood between uh, or from the lungs to the rest of the uh, cells throughout the body. It takes us to step number four, uh, internal respiration. The exchange of gases between the blood and the cells. This is much more of an internal process. That's why it's called internal respiration. So don't confuse external versus internal respiration. And lastly, uh, cellular respiration. This is using that oxygen that you breathe in to help produce uh, energy and then uh, forming a byproduct of carbon dioxide. All right, next we'll talk about the various tracts of the respiratory system. Uh, the organs of the system are divided into one of two tracts, uh, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Uh, for the upper, uh, this includes the nose, uh, the nasal cavity, uh, the sinuses, and the pharynx. And anything below that is considered the lower respiratory tract. So the larynx, the trachea, uh, the bronchial tree, and also the lungs. Uh, most people can figure out where these parts lie and which upper or lower tract. The two uh, components that get uh, confused most often are the pharynx and the larynx. And a good way to keep these straight, uh, pharynx starts with a P and there's P in upper. Larynx starts with an L and there's L in lower. All right, here's a basic image of the respiratory tract. They have the mouth here and the nose here, going down to the trachea, and then also the lungs. Okay, so for the upper respiratory tract, the nose, sinuses, uh, pharynx and for lower larynx and anything below that trachea uh, bronchial tree and the lungs all right now let's talk about individual uh, parts of the respiratory system we'll start with the nose and work our way into the respiratory system all right, the nose is filled with hairs to prevent uh, any larger particles from entering uh, the body if it's able to enter the nose it's able to get breathe into the lungs so you don't want any large particles that can help don't make you choke. So that's why the your hairs in the nose are there to block entry of those larger particles. Uh, the nasal cavity, this is the space just behind the nose, the hollow space just behind the nose, and it's separated uh, in half by what's called a nasal septum. A septum is always a divider. All right, and this nasal cavity is also lined with a mucous membrane to warm, uh, to moisten, and to filter the air that you breathe. If you've ever gone outside on a, a very cold day and taken a deep breath through your mouth, it almost will hurt your chest because it's, it takes more effort to warm that air before it gets to the lungs as opposed to just breathing through your nose. So breathing through your nose helps warm the air faster. All right, next we'll talk about the sinuses. And these are air-filled spaces within the maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones of the skull. If you've ever had a sinus infection, you know exactly where some of these places are. Uh, the mucous membrane lining is continuous with the lining of the nasal cavity. And these sinuses are there uh, for multiple reasons. One is to reduce the weight of the skull. If your skull were fully solid, of, fully, fully made of bone, it'd be incredibly heavy, and much heavier than it already is. So it'd be difficult to keep your head upright. It'd be so, so heavy. It also serves as a way to, serves as a voice resonant chamber. So this will help your voice echo and give it depth as you speak. That's why whenever you are sick, say with a cold or with a flu, and you are congested, your voice sounds different because all of that mucus and all that buildup is in the way, blocking uh, your voice from echoing throughout this chamber. So that's why you sound odd when you're sick. All right, here's a more detailed image of the upper part of the respiratory tract. Mouth and tongue here, the nose here, the various sinuses, there's the frontal sinus here. All right, next part we'll talk about is the pharynx. Uh, this is just uh, posterior to the oral cavity in between the nasal cavity and the pharynx. It's basically a generic term for the throat in general. 
and it serves as a passageway for food moving from the mouth uh, through the esophagus onto the stomach, and also air moving from the nasal cavity down to the lungs. So both food and air go through uh, the pharynx. Food goes down the esophagus, air goes down the trachea. And the pharynx has uh, three subdivisions, and the name tells you where it's located. Uh, you have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Nasopharynx, naso is a reference to uh, nasal, the nostril, nasal cavity, so it's just behind the nose. Oropharynx, oro is a reference to uh, mouth or oral, so it's just behind the mouth. And laryngopharynx, uh, right near the larynx. There's a nose and there's a nostril, just behind that, the nasopharynx, right here. Here's the mouth and the tongue, just behind that, oropharynx. Uh, here's the larynx here, right here. Just behind that, laryngopharynx. All right, now move on to the larynx, or the actual the voice box itself. Uh, this is an enlargement of the airway that's just above the trachea and just below the pharynx. It's made up of a very large network of uh, types of cartilages and different types of muscles. One of the two that we'll talk about uh, cartilage-wise is the thyroid cartilage. This is what will protrude outward, uh, forming what's called the Adam's apple, which is much more prominent in males. That's how you can tell if someone's uh, male or not, just by looking at their, at their throat. It actually juts out, it's very noticeable. That's the thyroid cartilage. This is how that would look, both from the uh, front here and from the back view. The part looks kind of like a shield, this part that juts out right there, that's the Adam's apple. But the whole thing is the thyroid cartilage. That piece right there would be the Adam's apple. And then taking this and turning it around, so you're looking at it from behind, that's how this looks. All right, and the second one that we'll talk about, uh, the epiglottic cartilage. This is the only one of all the cartilages found in the larynx that is made above elastic cartilage, not hyaline cartilage. And this epiglottic cartilage will help form a flap-like flap -like structure called the epiglottis. And this is important because this prevents food from going down into your lungs. Whenever you swallow, the tongue will push this flap down, blocking material from entering the lungs and directing everything else down into the stomach. So whenever you eat uh, too much food at once or eat too fast and people start to choke and people say that food went down the wrong way, that's what they're, what they're talking about. So going back to this image here, the epiglottis is right here. Okay. Trachea is here. Esophagus is here. This would lead to the stomach. This leads down to the lungs. So whenever you swallow, the tongue will force this down. Everything that is beyond that point will be directed into the esophagus. If you eat too quickly or eat too much at a time, food will get past this and get into the lungs. That's when you start to choke. All right, the larynx is made up of two horizontal folds of uh, muscle and connective tissue. Uh, the upper folds are called the false vocal cords because they do not produce any sound at all. It's the lower folds that are uh, what are called the true vocal cords. These are what will make uh, sound as vibrations pass over them. The faster air passes over these folds, the higher the pitch, the higher the noise. Okay, this is how it would look. Uh, the top two are illustrations, and this uh, bottom picture is real. So the glottis is the opening here. So you have the false vocal cords here and here. And the true would be these white ones here. These are what will vibrate and shake as air passes over them. And also, if someone is intubated uh, with, with a respirator, this is where the cord is actually going down into, going past the glottis into the trachea. That's what you're looking at right here where the cursor is. That's the very top part of your trachea. All right, moving on to the trachea, uh, also called the windpipe. It's a flexible tube. It's about 12 and a half centimeters long, and it's just in front or anterior to the esophagus. You can actually feel it in the front of your throat because it's held open by a very strong type of hyaline cartilage and they're in the shape of C's. Those C shaped rings of cartilage or help keep it open. That's why you can feel it so easily in the front of your throat. Now of course the trachea will be lined with mucous membranes that have cilia on them to help filter and clean the incoming air. So things that shouldn't be there aren't there anymore. This is how this looks. Thyroid cartilage or the Adam's apple up here would be part of the larynx. And you can tell how these look like little segments here. Those are all rings of hyaline cartilage that are in the shape of C's. And it goes all the way down here, then it forks off to the left and right lung. Now as these 
trachea will divide off into smaller and smaller units into each lung. They're called the bronchial tree. It's a very intricate series of branched airways that go from the trachea into the very, very tiny endpoints, which are called alveoli. Those are the uh, microscopic air sacs. The trachea will have two main divisions, the two primary bronchi, right and left, that enter the each lung. The, the right uh, primary bronchi goes to the right lung, left primary bronchi goes to the left lung. And from there they will divide more and more and keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, larynx up here with the Adam's apple, uh, trachea, left lung, right lung. And you see primary divisions here, that would be the right bronchus. They get more and more complicated names. They get primary, then you have secondary, then tertiary, and so on. The final end point of all of this structure is called the alveoli. If we were to inject dye into a all of the various divisions of the bronchial tree, this is how it would look. The trachea up here, uh, where they fork off right here. That would go to the left lung, that would go to the right lung. So you can see how detailed and how intricate it can be. All right, speaking of the alveoli, Alveoli is a plural term. The singular will be alveolus. This will help provide a large surface area of, of very thin epithelial cells to increase gas exchange. This is where all the work in the lungs gets done, where the oxygen and carbon dioxide get exchanged, and it's how your lungs work in these individual air sacs. And then during this gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide will be exchanged through the act of simple diffusion. So oxygen will diffuse from the walls of the alveoli into the blood and carbon dioxide will go from the blood to the alveoli. So it's something as vital and as necessary as gas exchange, carbon dioxide and oxygen, it all happens due to simple diffusion. So you're looking at a, a cluster they literally looks like they literally look like uh, clusters of grapes on a vine. These individual air sacs, those are the alveoli. And we'll take a look at just one. So this would be inside of the lungs, inside of the air sac. As blood comes from uh, the heart, it has to go to the lungs to pick up oxygen before it goes back to the heart. As it goes through the lungs, there is more oxygen inside the lungs than in, there is in the blood. So it exchanges or, or diffuses from the lungs to the blood. Conversely, there's more carbon dioxide in the blood than there are in the lungs. So carbon dioxide will diffuse from the blood into the lungs to be breathed out. The simple thing is going from an area of high concentration to area of low concentration. So again, this is just a close-up of just one alveolus, and there are literally millions of these in each lung. And this is where the actual work of the lungs takes place, exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. So at this point, the blood is now red on this image. That means it has oxygen. It will go back to the left-hand side of the heart, go to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, being pumped through the aorta. All right, here's how one would actually look. Each individual space here looks like a honeycomb. It would be the alveolus. And there's a very thin bronchiole that surrounds it. All right, next we'll talk about uh, the lungs in general. Of course, you have right and left lungs. Uh, they're going to be soft and spongy and uh, cone-shaped. And they're found in the uh, thoracic cavity. Uh, the right lung has three different lobes, and the left lung only has two. And the larger blood vessels and uh, lymphatic vessels and nerves will each enter the lung through an area called the hilum. Now this term hilum is not you know, specific for the lungs. It is a general term meant for any indented area where you have major vessels or nerves entering a structure. You'll see hilum again when we talk about uh, the kidney in a future chapter. So hilum doesn't just reference the lungs only. It's a general area. Okay, here's a image of both the thoracic cage with the lungs inside. Adam's apple up here, the thyroid cartilage, first part of the trachea here, it was left lung, right lung. All right, the lungs are covered with a very particular type of membrane called the pleura. And the pleural membrane is a thin and actually has two layers, uh, one called the parietal pleura, one called the visceral pleura. Uh, the parietal pleura is what lines the inside of the rib cage and also contacts the diaphragm. Visceral pleura is what covers the lungs directly. And these two terms here are also general terms. Anything that's going to be visceral will contact an organ directly. Anything that's parietal will line a cavity 
And even though there are these two membranes uh, very close together, there is a very, very small space between the two. And that's called the pleural cavity. And this cavity is filled with a type of fluid that helps the lungs be able to expand and then decrease in size. So they can inflate and deflate during respiration. All right, so here's what I mean. Of course, left lung, right lung. But the blue line will be the visceral pleural because it's contacting the lungs directly. And what happens is this membrane goes all the way around the lung. And when it gets to the hilum, it will actually double back on itself. And then the, the red line is the uh, parietal pleural. That's what will line the uh, thoracic cage. So it's really, it's a double membrane, but it's really one really long membrane that just folds back upon itself. And in this picture you'll see, this is a very exaggerated uh, scale. It's a very, very small space between uh, the visceral and parietal pleural. So it looks quite large here, but it's nowhere near this size. It is really, really quite small. And in here you'll find the fluid that helps the lungs uh, inflate and deflate. All right, next we'll talk about the uh, breathing mechanism. Uh, breathing, or also known as uh, ventilation, is the movement of air from the outside of the body uh, into the bronchial tree and then down to the alveoli. Now, the actions responsible for this are inspiration and expiration. And those are just the technical terms for uh, inhalation and exhalation. Uh, inhalation, breathing in, inspiration. When you exhale or breathe out, expiration. And it's important to keep these terms straight because these will come up again when we talk about various uh, lung volumes and lung capacities. All right, air moves in and out of the lungs all due to one thing. It's due to a difference of pressure. Not volume, not temperature, all due to a difference of pressure. And air will move from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, just like a concentration gradient would work. So instead of, instead of dealing with concentration, you're dealing with pressure. So this is exactly how air goes in and out of your lungs, due to a difference of pressure. Uh, the pressure and the volume of gases uh, found in the lungs are going to be inversely related. What that means is when one goes up, the other one goes down. That's referenced as, or also known as Boyle's Law when it comes to chemistry. If the pressure in your lungs goes up, the volume will go down. If the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. That's what's, being, that's what's meant by being inversely uh, related. All right, the first part, we'll talk about uh, inhaling or inspiration. As the diaphragm is signaled to contract, it flattens out. Its normal shape is a uh, like a bell shape. So when it contracts, it's actually getting flatter. So when you take a deep breath in, you are expanding the volume of your thoracic cavity. So when you do that, that means the pressure will go down. So this difference in pressure will mean atmospheric pressure will be higher than what's inside of your lungs. So air is basically pushed into your lungs due to that difference in pressure. Deep breath in, your volume expands, so volume goes up, but pressure goes down. And for the opposite of that, expiration or exhaling, uh, the forces responsible for this are the elastic recoil ability of your lung tissue and the surface tension within the alveoli. And these factors will increase the pressure within the alveoli to between one to three millimeters of mercury above atmospheric pressure. So air is actually forced out of your lungs. Okay, here's an image that has uh, both of these on here. Uh, normal atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere, for those that you, who, have, who are familiar with chemistry or physics. When you take a deep breath in, the lungs will expand, so volume goes up, but the pressure will drop to 757 millimeters of mercury. So pressure is higher outside than it is inside. So air gets forced into your lungs. Whenever you are exhaling, the volume will go down because you're exhaling, but the pressure goes up. The pressure goes up to 763 millimeters of mercury. 763 is higher than 760. Air gets pushed out from your lungs outside of your nose or mouth. That's how, in general, air moves into your lungs and moves out of your lungs, all due to, all due to a difference in pressure. And pressure and air will go from area of higher pressure to area of lower pressure. All right, next we'll talk about uh, the various respiratory volumes and capacities. So different degrees of effort in breathing will move different amounts of air in and out of the lungs. And we'll talk about four different types of volumes and two different types of capacities. And capacity is really just two or more different volumes combined. And these names can get kind of cumbersome, kind of confusing. All right, the first one, uh, TV or tidal volume. 
This is the amount of air that moves in and out of your lungs when you're at rest, like the tide at the beach. It goes in, it goes out with no extra effort needed. So when you're at, sitting there at rest, air moves in and out normally. Also called tidal volume or TV. And just like when we talked about the hormones and various acronyms that they all had, it's perfectly fine to call uh, tidal volume just TV. It's perfectly fine. The terms are interchangeable. Uh, the next one, the IRV, inspiratory reserve volume, is the amount of air that can be forcibly inhaled in addition to tidal volume. This is taking a deep breath in. So what on top of what you would normally be breathing in, you're forcing yourself to take more air in. So that's what the IRV is. It's taking a deep breath in. Uh, the opposite of that, the ERV, expiratory reserve volume, the amount of air that can be forced out in addition to tidal volume. Other than what you would normally breathe out, what can you force out? So this is taking, forcing all the air that you can out. It's the ERV. A residual volume, RV, this is the amount of air that's in your lungs at all times. Your lungs are always going to be uh, inflated like a balloon. There's, there's always going to be some amount of air always there. Unless there's some kind of injury, you know, being shot or being stabbed or some kind of injury where that pressure is equalized and that's when a lung collapses. When that pressure is not, or when that amount of air is not in the lungs. The lungs will basically collapse like a uninflated balloon. That's what a collapsing lung really is. In general, what you want is the lungs to always be somewhat inflated. And no matter what you do, you can't get that amount of air out apart from being injured, like being shot or stabbed or, or so on. Uh, next one, vital capacity or VC. It's the maximum amount of air that a person can inhale and exhale. So taking a deep breath in and forcing it all out. Because remember, it's a capacity, so we're talking about two or more volumes. So that's all that is. Taking a deep breath in and forcing it all out. And then the last one, uh, TLC, total lung capacity. This is everything that your lungs can hold. So really the vital capacity plus what's already there, the residual volume. So the total amount of volume that your lungs can carry. Now here's a chart that has all the ones that we talked about plus a few more that we didn't talk about. Uh, the smaller line here is the tidal volume. Normal breathing in and out at rest. Uh, the IRV, taking deep breath in. Uh, ERV, taking deep breath out. Here, uh, the re residual volume, the amount that's always in your lungs at all times, roughly a thousand to twelve hundred uh, milliliters. The vital capacity, the we can breathe in, taking deep breath in and forcing it all out. And of course, total lung capacity everything that your lungs can possibly carry. And of course that will vary greatly on whether or not you're male or female or your age or whether or not you're a smoker or you have other uh, conditions. The higher these, these numbers are, the better. All right, now move on to the alveolar gas exchange. Part of the wall of the alveoli is made up of cells that make a very special lipoprotein. It helps keep them inflated. This is called surfactant. This is what helps keep these little air sacs uh, moist and wet. They work better when they are damp because they will exchange gases faster. Now the problem is if too much surfactant is made where you get a very thick layer of mucus that builds up on these alveoli and it actually will crush them to the point where they can't work anymore, that's when you have cystic fibrosis or CF. So you want it to be somewhat damp, somewhat moist, and you want surfactant to be there, but you don't want too much of it. You get too much of it you're going to hurt lung function. You're going to kill lung tissue. And the actual site of gas exchange between the air in the alveoli and the blood happens at what's called the respiratory membrane. It's really just the membrane between the capillaries and the alveoli. All right, and here's how that would look. See, the AS would be the alveolar space, so inside of the those air sacs, the alveoli. These are red blood cells squeezing through. So these are red blood cells going into the air sacs of the lungs to pick up oxygen to deliver to other tissues in the body. All right, and the last topic we'll talk about here, oxygen transport. See, almost all oxygen is carried within the blood on red blood cells by a pigment called oxyhemoglobin. This is just the combination of the pigment hemoglobin found in red blood cells and oxygen. That's how you get oxyhemoglobin. Just those two kind of stuck together. And there are factors that will increase the release of oxygen, uh, such as the uh, a decrease in partial pressure of oxygen, 
So if that drops, then that means your body needs more oxygen, so it will be released faster. And there's an increase in carbon dioxide, so if there's an increase in that, your body is going to need more oxygen to counteract that. Uh, also, an increase in temperature or increase in acidity. Both of those will lead to your body needing more oxygen. So those four triggers, among others, will help increase the release of oxygen to your cells in the body. Okay, that brings us to the end of Chapter 13, Respiratory System. If you have any questions, like always, please feel free to contact me.